Coming up, a revival inside an unlikely place. He said, you're going all holy on me, ain't you? Hear how one oil man is reaching our nation's prisons with the gospel. He got caught and I didn't. The only difference is he's in prison and I'm not. Plus, she's feisty and feminine. The president of Concerned Women for America shares how to win the culture wars. Then, a two-time gold medal winning skate shooter. My best day is perfection. On today's 700 Club. And welcome everyone to the 700 Club. The worst of the rainfall from Harvey is finally over for the Houston area, but the death toll in Texas is still rising. It reached 30 by this morning. Heather Sells has this look at Harvey's terrible impact on America's fourth largest city. The rain from Harvey, over 50 inches in some spots, makes it the heaviest tropical downpour in the history of the continental United States. And while the downpour in Houston has basically ended, the floodwaters are still rising. It's all the way up to the roofs, guys, oh, up to the okay. eaves. I hate to think that there are people in these houses. The official tally of rescues right now is 13,000, but the actual number is likely much higher. And still, more than 1,000 in Houston are desperately waiting for help. This woman was stranded in her car for two days. All I can say is there are angels out here. Don't give up on us. Seek the higher ground. We will get to you. The city of Houston covers about 10,000 square miles. That's slightly bigger than New Jersey and makes rescue operations a daunting task. Houston police officer Steve Perez drowned in the flood waters on his way to help others. Once our dive team got there, it was too treacherous. To, to go under and look for him. Torrential rains 6 to 12 inches are still expected east of Houston into Louisiana. Houston itself should receive less than 2 to 3 more inches, but rising floodwaters are now the concern, especially after two reservoir dams began to overflow Tuesday. Officials are watching bridges, roads, and pipelines in the path of the floodwaters. And they're attending to more than 17,000 people that have sought refuge in Texas shelters. Houston opened two extra mega shelters Tuesday and has asked FEMA for food and cots for 10,000 more people. The president visited Corpus Christi on Tuesday near where Harvey made landfall last Friday. He promised to provide billions of dollars in long-term disaster aid and talked with state officials about the magnitude of the disaster. This is historic, it's epic what happened but you know what? It happened in Texas, and Texas can handle anything. The president plans to return to the region on Saturday as it recovers from this historic natural disaster. Heather Sells, CBN News. Thank you, Heather. And as Heather just mentioned, thousands of people have gone to shelters in Houston. CBN's Eric Rosales visited one of those shelters. He found that evacuees are thankful to be alive, but they're worried about their future. I'm here at the George R. Brown Convention Center in downtown Houston, where some 9,000 people are seeking shelter. No one will be turned away, according to the Red Cross. But people here, many with only the clothes on their backs, have lost everything, their property, their home, and many don't even know where their other family members are. I've never had it like this. I feel like a homeless man, nowhere to go. But. You know, my faith, it won't change. Minister Larry Daniel recently moved to the area with his wife, Rhonda. On Sunday, as floodwaters rose, she rushed to a nearby hospital where her friend had been taken. While she was gone, Daniel was forced to evacuate their Dickinson mobile home. Now, he has no idea where she is. He says a friend tried to call her. I haven't heard back from him, so... She had my phone, of course, having cell phones, you don't remember numbers anymore. Right. He says right now he's broken, but will continue to keep his faith. You know, when I need it, it shows, so God's providing. It just, it, it happened so quick, there was, you know, within a few hours, it was like three feet in there, and, um, you know, so I just grabbed, you know, grabbed whatever I could. And Sean Palmer says he's thankful for a man who came by his flooded home in a kayak and saved his life. And he saved me. And and what had put him out there was just, you know, his, he wanted to help people. And, he was on, and, and 
you know, if, you know, if the, the Holy Spirit didn't move his heart, I don't know, you know, what would have happened to me. We heard story after story of how God moved ordinary people to step in and save lives. Others wanted to help, but rising floodwaters prevented it. This is what it looked like outside of Houston's Lakewood Church. But everything around us was flooded, all the highways, all the feeder roads. It was just dangerous to try to in any way, number one, get volunteers here, or other people just couldn't reach the church. However, some media outlets criticized Lakewood and Pastor Joel Osteen for not immediately welcoming those forced from their homes by Hurricane Harvey. We told the city that now that George R. Brown is full, let us help, we'll do anything we can to help. And you know what, we're not here just for this stage, we're here to help rebuild and tear down and rebuild and clean up, and so we're here for the long haul, but during that window where we were being sieged, people don't realize we just couldn't move and it was dangerous to move. And here at Lakewood Church, about 300 evacuees are currently being housed. And you can see behind me the amount of support from Houstonians all uh, all over that are bringing supplies here at Lakewood Church. And we're joined with Pastor Osteen. Pastor, thank you so much for joining us. Hey, great to be with you. Talk to us a little bit about the, uh, 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 the criticism. Let's set the record straight. Well, the church has always been open. We received evacuees just early on. Uh, some of them wanted to go to a larger shelter that was set up. But the, the notion that we were going to turn people away is not true. The first couple of days, the church was inaccessible or not safe. There's, you know, it looks like it's on this big hill, but right behind me, this, this, this building is flooded before when the Rockets had it to play basketball back in 2001. So we had to be very cautious there, but once we got it up and running, the other, the other shelter filled up and now we're receiving people and just, um, you know, making a, making a difference in our community. I mean, you're here for the long haul. Yeah. I mean, you want to see Houston rebuilt. That's exactly right. It's, you know, this is, you know, a week or two, these, these uh, people that are sheltered will be moved on. But, uh, you know, the next five years, we'll have teams working in the community. We're still helping people from Katrina. And so, you know, that's what it's all about, you know. And, and I love, too, that, you know, I get to talk a lot, but this is getting to show the community what Lakewood is all about. And so today, thousands of volunteers will come out and bring all these supplies, and we'll take them to the different shelters here in town. It's just amazing that the generosity and the support that Lakewood has in this community. It really is. Uh, you know, I've been blessed to be here. My, my parents started it almost 60 years ago and helping people and it's grown into this. And now just to see the, you know, the people come out, you know, even sometimes these difficult times, it brings out the best in people. They, you know, they put down all the divisiveness that's going on in the society and say, hey, let's go help somebody. Well, from all of us at CBN News, our prayers continue for Lakewood Church and the entire Houston area. Well, we appreciate you guys. Thank you so much, Pastor. Again, about 300 people are currently housed here at Lakewood Church. Uh, Wendy, it's, uh, we do have a break in the clouds, so that is definitely good news. It's bringing hope to the people here and the hope of God as well. Amen. And right now, that's what people need so much. Thanks so much, Eric, and great that you were able to talk to Pastor Joel. Well, where is God in the midst of this national, national disaster? CBN News is talking to Texas Governor Greg Abbott and Texas Senator and Ted Cruz today on Faith Nation to answer that question. You can watch that on the CBN News Facebook page that's coming online at 1230 Eastern Time. That's facebook.com slash Faith Nation. Well, CBN's Operation Blessing is helping people who've been hit hard by Harvey in several cities in Texas. And OB's Vice President Jody Getty says the team went into one community that had lost power and needed basic supplies. We had a truck come into Taft, Texas today. This is a community a little inland that is still without power. We're five days out. The power's starting to come on, but all these residents, there's hundreds of cars lined up that still don't have potable water and electricity. So Operation Blessing unloaded a semi truck full of food, water, personal hygiene items, just the basics of life to help make life a little bit easier here in Taft. Thanks so much, Jody. And so often Operation Blessing is one of the first on the scene when disaster strikes. If you'd like to help with Operation Blessing's ongoing efforts, you can designate your gift to Operation Blessing International Disaster Relief Fund. Just call the number that you see on your screen, toll free 1-800-700-0700, or you can log on to CBN.com. Donations may also be mailed to Operation Blessing International Disaster Relief Fund, CBN Center, Virginia Beach, Virginia, 23463. And we are so glad that OB is on the scene. They're helping those Texans who need it so much. Well, coming up, meet a business tycoon who traded a job on the oil pipelines for one inside the Texas prisons.
That's what we say in prison evangelism, changing hearts and closing prisons. So the return on investment is incredible. See how he's redeeming the lives of people behind bars. That's next. High numbers of people in prison have politicians, policymakers, and religious leaders rethinking criminal justice in America. It's a system that some argue relies too heavily on locking people up and not nearly enough on rehabilitating them. John Jessup introduces us to a Texas businessman on a twofold mission to save souls and close prisons. It's line pipe for 36 inch line pipe. David Hell yeah, knows a good investment like when he sees the one. They're taking pipe all over the place. At 14, he started working in the oil industry. Today, he makes a living buying old underground pipes and rehabilitating them, giving second life to what many might consider waste. It is ultimate recycling yeah. to me. And it's like I said, it's just tubular steel that can be used and reused. In a way, David's career has come full circle much like his life. If you can imagine a total self-centered life, uh, me, 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 that, that was me, me, me. And a lot of that centered around uh, alcohol, sex, uh, uh, all the things, money, uh, and just, just taking care of my own personal needs. As a young husband and father, he wanted to abandon his destructive lifestyle. So he turned to Alcoholics Anonymous and soon after found himself in church. I jumped into AA and became Mr. AA. And when I became a Christian, I, I said, this is going to be an all or nothing deal for me as well. Now sober for more than 35 years, David's dedicated his new life to sharing his story with anyone who will listen. I would find people outside of a meeting and would go to lunch or go to coffee and and I would write stick figures and, and show people the story of Jesus. The AA crowd, you know, being part of that and that, that he used a, a lot there and, and kind of experimented there, I think that was sort of his testing ground. Several years ago, he wrote a book called How to Be a Child of God, and that opened a new door. Even though he is a gifted evangelist by gift, he never really had seen this coming. I never saw this coming. David's success has served him well, but after 30 years in the industry, he's spending less time reclaiming old pipes on the oil field and spending more time on the mission field reclaiming souls for Christ. In places like this, behind wire fencing, with armed guards and under constant surveillance, David Howell's book is making the biggest impact. CBN News obtained rare access to talk with prisoners about the value of David's 52-page how-to guide. Since I read that book, I changed my life. Kareef Gilstrap anxiously awaits his release in September after serving a two-year sentence for aggravated assault with a deadly weapon. Kareef, how else have you changed? Has there been a change in your personality and your behavior? Yes, Dave. I've, I've learned how to tame my tongue. I've been reading my Bible more, doing a lot of Bible study. So yes, definitely. Do you think others have noticed the changes as well? Yes. My sailor, he's been telling me. <laughs> what has he told you? He was like, you, you, <laughs> he said, you going all holy on me. I was like, man, I'm trying to get right, man. I got when I get back out there, I can't be who I used to be. Jackie Beaver's anger issues landed him in prison for more than 20 years, serving time for aggravated robbery and kidnapping. He wrote to David to tell him his book was amazing and opened his eyes to a lot he didn't know. Like I'm a true believer that Jesus Christ died for my sins. And when I read that book, it's like a breath of fresh air. It's like something took over me. CBN News was there to record the moment both men personally got to thank the author. For David, the meeting only confirms the call to keep reaching out to the two million American men and women behind bars. Here I am, 77, and I'm a roughneck from South Texas. And what do I know about writing a book about salvation? But I could identify with those kind of people. I've roughnecked with them, I've worked with them. For all the things that I did in all those years of, of that hellish living, he got caught and I didn't. The only difference is he's in prison and I'm not. Prison volunteer Rick Pritchard hands out copies of How to Be a Child of God. He says it's colorful, easy to understand, and produces real change in a place of physical 
and often spiritual bondage. They're free. And you can tell when they got Jackie, the smile, the smile on their faces, you know they're free, they're free inside. David wants to get 600,000 copies of his book into America's largest state and federal prisons and county jails, all with the goal of helping men and women behind bars experience spiritual freedom. And that's what we say in, in prison evangelism, uh, changing hearts and closing prisons. So the return on investment is, is incredible. Reporting for the East Ham Unit in Lovelady, Texas, I'm John Jessup for CBN News. Thanks, John. Wouldn't that be a great world if there were no prisons? Well, many people say one reason we need to reform our judicial system is simple. The U.S. puts more people in prison than any other country. Well, up next, she's feisty and she's feminine. Penny Young Nance sounds a rallying cry for conservative women to stand up and be heard. The CEO and president of Concerned Women for America joins us after this. If you haven't ordered your free DVD yet, do it today. It's called Protect Your Brain, Five Ways to Stay Mentally Sharp and Brain Healthy. The experts on this DVD will tell you how you can reduce your risk of developing Alzheimer's, reduce your chance of stroke, discover the secret to a younger brain, and change dangerous habits that threaten your overall health. It's yours absolutely free to order. Just call us right now, 1-800-700-7000, or go to CBN.com come to request your free DVD. Well, we're about to meet one very remarkable woman. Her journey as an advocate began when she was just four years old. Since then, she's been unstoppable, especially as the leader of the nation's largest public policy women's organization. Take a look. Women have been marching for equal rights for hundreds of years. And today, women continue to bring important issues to light, like equal pay, and gender and reproductive rights. Meet Penny Young Nance. She is the CEO and president of Concerned Women for America. She says there's a right and a wrong way to respond to these difficult, hot button issues facing our culture today. In her book, Feisty and Feminine, Penny reveals who is really waging the war on women and gives a rallying cry for us to speak the truth about things that matter most. And please welcome to the 700 Club, Penny Young Nance. Penny, it's so nice to meet oh, you. Oh, what an honor to be here, Wendy. I've been a fan of yours for a long time. Thank you. Well, let's, Mine, yours. <laughs> well, let's start talking about how you became an advocate. I know you were four years old and you would get up on the table and just start preaching to your dolls. <laughs> That's true, yes. And uh, my dad was a Baptist minister, so uh, you know I spent a lot of time in church. But really, that whole idea of sort of the, the spark that God put in my heart came into full fruition when I was at Liberty University. As a young undergrad, Jerry Falwell Sr. was very thoughtful about bringing into the young students women leaders. Right. And he brought in women like Peggy Waymeyer from ABC yeah. News, and he brought in um, uh, um, Elizabeth Dole, and then my mentor and the chairman of CWA. And at that moment, I realized I felt like I was being called to advocacy. I wanted to speak for the least of these, speak for the unborn. Yeah. And so that was my sort of Esther moment when I knew that I was being called. And you know, it, it, there is something to it, isn't it? When, when there's men in authority that yes. give that freedom and that permission yes. for the, the women to rise up and to have a voice. And yes. you found that at Liberty and you found Very that through much. Jerry Falwell. And then, well, you're a Kentucky girl, right? Yes, and my dad was a pastor in, uh, in Appalachia, Eastern Tennessee, Eastern Kentucky. and you know, I came to Washington with no social capital. You read the Bikil Billy elegy that's very, you know, yeah. being w widely read. That was sort of my experience, although I had a good, sound family. Okay, so I'm from southern West Virginia, and oh, you're from right. eastern Kentucky, yes. so we must be, we yeah, are practically we probably, neighbors. We probably shopped at, at Huntington Mall <laughs> together. Yes, we did, <laughs> I'm sure. Um, well, the title of your book is called... Uh, feisty and feminine, and I just love this picture. It's a little Thank sassy. Um, why did you choose this title? You know, I, I wanted to, frankly, honestly rebrand conservative women. Yeah. I think the left did a really great job of um, miscommunicating and obfuscating who we are. I, I, as the leader of Concerned Women for America, I meet conservative Christian women all over this country. And I can tell yeah. you that they're bright, they're sassy, they're thoughtful, they're beautiful, and they're committed. And, uh, you know, I wanted to sort of rebrand that and tell the world who we really are, and at the same time, call these women to action. And call like our stilettos. Women. 
We yes, like our stilettos. Can we yes. please get a shoe cam? No, yeah, yeah, no more shoe shaming. There's some of that going on right now. Yes, I, because I, we have, let's face it, we have one of the most gorgeous first ladies yes. um, in the world, and she's classy, and she likes and to wear her high heels. Right? And that has actually been criticized. Yes, I, I wear left. high heels on, on airplanes all the time, including yesterday. And uh, and by the way, I wrote a piece in foxnews.com specifically on this idea of, you know, wh why? You're just picking a fight. It's ridiculous. So after you left Liberty, uh, you went to Washington. I did. And, uh, I did. And, you, and you talk about some of the mentors that you had there and the experience that you, that you had in D.C. Yes, I mean, this is, again, Wendy, this is all God. I mean, I, I had no connections. I'm a preacher's kid from Appalachia. I didn't know anyone, but um, God opened doors. I went to work on Capitol Hill for a congressman from Georgia, and he lost his reelection, and I started working in, in public affairs and landed at Concerned Women for America, which I had already been a member of in college, so I already wow. knew who Beverly LaHaye was. Um, I went there for about five or six years as a young lobbyist and learned so much. And you, and met, your you met your husband almost right away. Yes, so mm -hmm. we, through church, yeah. <laughs> yeah. at uh, McLean Presbyterian Church, it was a PCA church in the area we met, and he was working for Chuck Colson at Prison Fellowship Ministries. And, um, and yes, it, there he is. We, yes, he's wonderful. He's and some guy. We've been married, uh, to, what, 21 years now, I think? And, and, he, and what an amazing man. And, of course, then I ended up working for Colson. He worked for Colson. He left. I ended up working for Colson, well, too. Well, tell us what happened. I know you got pregnant pretty soon after yeah. you got married. Three and then months. you were, Penny, you were out jogging one day, yes. and uh, you were attacked That's by true. a man. Tell us what happened. And I talk about this in the book more yeah. extensively, but, you know, uh, early on in my pregnancy, and I've been a, a runner since my 20s, um, I went for a morning run, and a complete stranger that I didn't know uh, attacked me, drug me down behind, uh, you know, an embankment. Um, his intention was to rape me. He actually attacked two other women. But you and heard the Holy Spirit say I something to you. I heard the Holy Spirit say, first he told me to pause at the beginning yeah. of the hill. Right. And, and I, it, I don't say this lightly. I'm, I'm actually not the girl that says God told me. Right. I, I, I generally get that information through the Bible. Sure. But I did hear the Holy Spirit that day saying, pause. And mm -hmm. um, and then because of it, I paused, a motorist saw what was happening, mm. and um, and I, the assault was stopped because she stopped. A woman stopped, and it was purely from God's protection. I don't know why I was protected, and I don't know why there's a little survivor's guilt there, but it has given me a platform to speak for the least yeah. of these and talk about the issue of rape and the fact that we're not testing the DNA kits that are being collected within states often. There's a lot of work, and I talk about that in my book. Yeah. You also talk a lot about marriage, and you say yes. that marriage is a mess in America. Yes. Can you talk yes. about it? Well, you know, we're very comfortable in the church talking about, you know, gay marriage or, you know, homosexuality or this, that, and the other, but I, I think that we're missing a very big piece of it. And first, God's calling us to lead on the issue of marriage with our own marriages. Right. And we're getting ready to have a, an event at C, uh, in Washington for CWA leaders, and we're doing a prayer and praise service. A big part of that is going to be rededication of our own marriages. Um, cohabitation rates are astronomical in the U.S. We have changed the way we view marriage. Uh, young people are not getting married. If they do get married, they're getting married much later. And so we've got to lead on this issue by being, you know, the Esther's, and advocating yeah. for God's truth and the beauty of marriage and living that out in our lives. That's what I'm wondering, are, are Christians, are we doing any better than the world when it comes to marriage? The numbers are, are yeah. you know, are, are very telling yeah. that, that divorce is alive and well in the Christian church. And, you know, it starts in our pulpits. Uh, when I talk to pastors, I right. urge them to, to preach the truth, preach what the Bible says, not just the comfortable parts of it, the sure. uncomfortable parts of it, because we need work. to hear it. Yeah. It's a lot of work. And, yes. of course, Concerned Women for America is a huge advocate of marriage, but you're also a huge advocate in, in fighting for life, right. uh, pro-life issues. How can we make a difference in on the life issue? You know, Roe v. Wade is... I, and I know you guys are doing that yes. with legislation. 44 years. Mm. So yes, 44 years of Roe v. Wade, and people will tell you, oh, it's settled law. Let me just tell you, it's not. We have the numbers to prove it. America is much more pro-life than our laws. And the change in uh, public policy is downstream of public opinion. Public opinion's with us. Right. They may not be with me that life begins at conception, but they're certainly not in line with the fact that our current law allows abortion
abortion at any time, and there's government funding. We're funding Planned Parenthood at the rate of 300, and, or excuse me, at the rate of $500,000 a year, or excuse me, Five, <laughs> half a billion dollars a year, $500 mm. million dollars a year, that's an important distinction, yeah. of our tax dollars to the nation's largest abortion provider. They do one in every three abortions in this country. It has to end. And Concerned Women is trying to get that money moved over to community health Correct. organizations. We are looking to shift the money from the about 800 brick and mortar Planned Parenthood clinics that claim they do help women's health, but they're mostly about abortion, to the 13,000 community health centers that really do yeah. care for poor women. We can we can How's do better. How's that going? How's it going? Well, we had it actually all worked out in the health care bill that went down in Congress. We are looking for other opportunities, and we are actually going to keep mm -hmm. working. We know that this president, Donald Trump, is in line with us on this issue, and by the way, mm -hmm. is agreed and is has lived up to only appointing constitutionalist judges who people who are constitutionalists understand the Constitution and understand the right to life. So mm -hmm. Neil Gorsuch is of course a perfect example of that. We are at a point in history where we can we can reverse Roe v. Wade and throw yeah. it back to the states. And then of course there's a fight at the state level and there's a, that's an easier place to work. But the heavy hand of government forcing states like Mississippi and, and West Virginia and Tennessee and Kentucky to, to do and pay for abortions that are against the will of the people has got to end. Well, you have found your voice for sure, Penny, but you say it's time for conservative w women to yes. find their voice. What do you yes. mean? Well, Wendy, I believe this is our Esther moment. You know, I, uh, if you take the time to read the book of Esther, you, you see a woman who didn't particularly want to be in the position of authority, but God brought her to that. Absolutely. And she was able to pr first pray and then prepare, which is why I wrote the book, as a tool book to have good, solid yeah. information, statistics, to lean into the conversation. And then she spoke truth, and she spoke mm. truth to power. And I believe that is what women in America, women like us, conservative women of faith are being called to do right now. And we hope to help you do that at Concerned Women for America and with our book. Amen. All right, Penny. Well, Penny's book is called Feisty and Feminine, A Rallying Cry for Conservative Women. It's available wherever books are sold. You can also hear more from Penny in our social exclusive interview on Facebook. To watch that, go to facebook.com slash 700 club. Penny Young Nance, Thank God you. bless you. And God thanks bless so you, much sister. for what you're doing. Thank you. <laughs> well, still ahead, an accident when she was eight years old left this woman in pain for nearly 50 years. I would have migraines at least once a week. I couldn't even brush my teeth because I couldn't, I couldn't open it enough to get a toothbrush in. See how she got instant relief without surgery. That's coming up later on today's 700 Club. The 700 Club. Transgenders can continue serving in the military for now. President Trump reversed an Obama administration policy allowing transgenders in the military. But USA Today reports Secretary of Defense Jim Mattis says he'll wait for the results of a study before implementing the new order. Trump's order said transgenders should not be accepted into the military and those already serving should be evaluated based on their ability to deploy for service. It also said the military will not provide medical treatment for what's called gender dysphoria, which used to be known as gender identity disorder. President Trump is moving on from his trip to Texas yesterday. Today, he's starting his public push for his plans to reform the tax code and cut taxes to help pick up economic growth. The president is speaking in Missouri today, laying out the reasons why he thinks the tax burden has, has to be reduced. But the details of that tax plan will be coming later from the president's team and key members of Congress. Remember, you can always get the latest from CBN News by going to our website. It's CBNNews.com. Wendy will be back with much more of the 700 Club. It's coming up right after this. Young Enlin spends his days exploring caves and fending off snakes along the way. But he isn't a boy searching for adventure. He's desperately trying to find water. After Mr. Zhao died, his son Enlan took over the bulk of his father's responsibilities. One of his biggest jobs was fetching water from a cave far away. I became the man of the family. My brother is my hero. One time I saw a snake in the cave. I was afraid he would bite us. 
My brother rushed in front of me and took care of everything. Enlin drove the snake away, and he and his sister managed to bring back a few buckets of water. But as usual, it was dirty. It was muddy, and there were small bugs and leaves in it. We didn't like to drink it. Mrs. Zhao rarely washed her children's clothes, and she was always worried they'd get sick, either from bad water or poor nutrition. Even though she worked hard in construction, she only made eight dollars a day, leaving very little money for food. We haven't had much meat since my dad died, and we don't even have eggs. I was weak a lot. Sometimes I could barely lift a stone. I hated seeing my kids suffer so much. I tried so hard. I didn't know what else to do. I worried that things would never change. A local pastor who knew about this widow's struggle told CBN, and we made sure the Zhao's got their own cistern and water filter. Well, we have lots of clean water now. Finally, my mom doesn't have to carry water, and we can even wash our faces and feet. We also help Mrs. Zhao start a livestock business so she can take better care of her family. The pig will give birth to baby pigs, and we'll have lots of money. I don't have to worry about my children anymore. We are all so happy. Our life is getting better and better. Thank you to everyone who helped us. Clean water changes everything and brings so much happiness to that little family. If you'd like to be a part of bringing that kind of joy. Uh, to people all over the world, you can do that. I encourage you right now to go to your phones and just say, yes, I want to join the 700 Club. The number on your screen, or you can log on to CBN.com. Uh, when you do that, we have a free gift for you right now. It's Pat's new teaching called Miracles. Experience God's power in your own life. If you need a miracle or you know someone who does, you've got to get a hold of this. This will, your faith will soar. These stories are in. Incredible. They are true miracles. And listen, God's no respecter of person. What he does for someone else, he can do and will do for you. Also, uh, when you join, be sure to ask for Pledge Express because uh, we want to give you this uh, monthly teaching called Power for Life that you only get when you join Pledge Express. Basically, the, your bank does all the work. There's no stamps, no check, no hassle. Um, and it just comes out automatically from your um, checking account every month. And you'll get this as well. So give us a call. We look forward to hearing from you. Well, up next, a two-time Olympic gold medalist and three-time world champion. And I've competed in hurricanes, I've competed in blizzards, and you have to be able to perform perfectly every time. So to me, there is no greater challenge than trying to beat yourself every time. Skeet shooter Vincent Hancock talks about the pressures behind his pursuit of perfection after this. To see this week's most viewed stories, go to CBN.com. And welcome back. You're watching The 700 Club. Performing perfectly every time. That's what skeet shooter Vincent Hancock says is required to compete in the sport. He's the first skeet shooter to win the gold in two consecutive Olympic Games. And Vincent gives all the credit to God. I do feel like God is there saying, this is what you're meant to do. This is your passion. I put it in you for a reason. That's why I say I won the only gold medal that counts. I'm Vincent Hancock, and God made me faithful. Two-time Olympic gold medalist and three-time world champion Vincent Hancock knew at 10 years old that the sport of skeet fueled a passion inside him. It's much like golf with the, with the mentality that you have to have. It's a pre-shot routine and you have to execute perfectly every single time. I and mean, I've competed in hurricanes, I've competed in blizzards, and you have to be able to perform perfectly every time. So to me, there is no greater challenge than trying to beat yourself every time. He won his first world championship at 16 and recognized that self-reliance and determination were key to his success. If I have my best day, I know that I'm never going to lose because my best day is perfection. Oh. 
I've worked hard for years and years and years to be able to get to that point. In 2008, while in training for the Beijing Olympics, he married Rebecca. She quietly tried to keep him grounded in Christ. I was trying to always encourage him to know that God is in control. And in any times of worry or any times of need, like, hey, God is, God's with us and God has our back. I had always thought of myself as being a Christian, but looking back now, I was anything but. I was focused on the gold and that was my only thought process. I mean, I basically drug her along with me. Vincent was the world champion and favored to win the gold. He did and rode the high for a while. I rode that high, I won the world championships in 2009 for my second time. But in 2010, Vincent only medaled once and began growing irritable and demanding at home. And then it kind of all culminated in my worst year, in one of our worst years of our relationship as well in 2011, where I was competing the worst I'd ever competed. I wasn't having fun anymore and I didn't know what to do. And I was trying to encourage him and tell him just, just pray and just ask God and be at that place with God so he can lead you to where he wants you to go. Finally, his wife's words sank in and he took her advice. I was frustrated at her, I was frustrated at myself, I was frustrated at God and I just, I, I prayed for hours that night and, and cried uh, for hours. That night, God started opening up my eyes and, and showing me the things that I had done, uh, the things that I had done wrong. So it, it allowed me to kind of fix things and say, God, you're right. I am so sorry that I've gotten to this point where I know that I want to be successful in my sport, but I have to focus on you and I have to focus on my family first. Our relationship has blossomed into something that it's never been before, and it's so, so much better now. A year later in London, Vincent became the first skeet shooter to ever repeat as an Olympic champion. He credits God for it all, the wins and the change of heart. He showed me the person that I wanted to be, but he also showed me that I can continue doing what I'm doing and still be the person that he needs me to be. He truly cares about the platform God has given him only to give it back to God. For Vincent, it's not about accomplishments. It's about what God has done through him for God. In 2016, to the surprise of many, Vincent failed to reach the Olympic finals in Rio, but his faith in God wasn't shaken. Faithful to me means trusting. And for me, at the beginning of my career, I trusted only in myself and I trusted that I want to go and I want to win a gold medal. But to me, God has made me faithful because now I know what faith truly is. It's having a trust in what God has put in my life. I trust in Him, I believe in Him, I love Him, and I'm faithful to the aspect of He is my God. It's easy to trust God when everything is sunny and everything's going great, isn't it? When we have our strength and we can put our faith in our own abilities, but what if everything falls apart. Will you still trust God? It's not as easy, but God is still faithful. He still loves you. He's still with you. He's the God of the turnaround. What he did for Vincent, he can do for you. And in fact, even when Vincent didn't win the gold, he was still happy because he wasn't putting all of his happiness into perfection. You know, when we do that, we're just miserable because nobody's perfect except Jesus. Well, if you're struggling today, if you need, if you just need someone to agree with you in prayer right now, we have some wonderful prayer warriors, some wonderful phone counselors that are standing by right now that would love to talk with you and pray with you and, uh, and help you just restore that hope and, and build your faith. So give them a call, the number on your screen, 1-800-700-7000, if that's you, they would love to pray with you. Well, up next, the story of seven brothers raised on the original Superbook series. See how they're now sharing the new Superbook with their kids. That was our good-looking control room right there. Way to go, guys. 
All right, Superbook is bringing the stories of the Bible to the children of the world, one family at a time. I wonder if they're blushing. Okay, you're about to meet a family that's creating their own Superbook legacy. Matt Olson and his six brothers were raised with the original Superbook series, and now a new generation of Olsons is following in their footsteps and beyond. Grandma Olson knows how to throw a fun party for her grandkids. Pop a little popcorn and play an episode of Superbook. Here we go. I get really excited to come over and watch Superbook. It is so good to have you home. I see my grandchildren smiling and laughing, totally involved with the stories. Yeah, it makes the Bible come alive. Like I can really feel it. Like, oh, what's next? What's next? And I just want to learn a lot. You can look up what Superbook movie you're going to be watching. You can just open it and follow along. It would be exactly true with the Bible. That's something Grandma Olson's son, Matt, loves about Superbook. He and his six brothers were raised on the original series. Studying the Bible myself, I, I see things on the screen. I'm like, hey, that is in the Bible. And they're actually accurately portraying the stories and, and some of the even the minute details of what go into these stories. And it really gets my kids interested, and I love it. Today, Matt's kids have a tool he never had, the free Superbook app. It's just amazing. It tells you about the characters, the artifacts, the games are awesome. It's just an awesome place to go to on the phone. I love the Superbook app because you can go on there anytime you want to. If you're feeling afraid or something's going on. There's so much darkness in the videos and some of the things that the kids watch these days and so much violence and immorality. You have something like Superbook that brings light that would counterbalance this darkness that has come into their life. I'm very thrilled that that legacy is being passed down to the grandkids. And Grandma Olson's glad her partnership with CBN is bringing Superbook and the stories of the Bible to the children of the world. Seems to be accepted with all governments, even those that you think would not accept it, they're accepting Superbook. And this will bring a lot of kids into the kingdom, seeing these stories when they're little. Plus, it'll help them when they're older. They'll remember these things that they learned, where they can trust their Heavenly Father to take care of them, to lead them. Just one question. Um, do you know when they're gonna make their next Superbook movie? <laughs> I wish I had an answer for you. Well, when you join the Superbook DVD Club, you'll receive three copies of the newest episode of Superbook for your recurring gift of $25 on a credit or debit card. Then every four weeks, Maybe this is the answer. Uh, every four weeks, you'll be one of the first to receive each new Superbook episode, and your account will be automatically debited $25. When you join today, we have a bonus offer. You'll receive three copies of our newest episode, Paul and Silas, along with the End of Summer Champions bonus pack containing three additional Superbook episodes, Joseph and Pharaoh's Dream, Esther, For Such a Time as This, and Gideon, all six DVDs for just $25. So give us a call, 1-800-700-7000, or go to CBN.com to join now. DVD club members can also stream all episodes of season one and season two for free. So you want to get this. All right, up next, see how a woman is instantly healed after almost 50 years of pain. Plus, we're going to be praying for you and your needs right after this. Well, imagine being in pain for nearly 50 years. That's exactly what life was like for Kathy Paranzino until one day when she was watching the 700 Club. It was difficult to eat at times. It was constantly clicking. Kathy Paranzino suffered with jaw pain for years. It started with the pool accident when she was eight. I went to jump in the pool, I spun around, and the lower part of my chin caught the edge the concrete edge of the pool. The cut on her chin healed, but the pain in her jaw never went away. A few years later, she learned she had TMJ, so the doctor ordered a mouthpiece for her to wear to help align her jaw. 
I was supposed to wear it as much as possible, but it didn't work and the doctor suggested surgery and I was not going to do surgery. So Kathy figured it was something she'd have to live with. I was eating soft food. I couldn't eat anything hard or you know anything like ice or you know anything that was crunchy. So I was suffering with headaches. I was taking Excedrin or aspirin just about every day. I would have migraines at least once a week. The pain meds helped Kathy function. So she kept taking them and ate soft food for nearly 50 years. But one morning, she could barely move her mouth at all. I couldn't even brush my teeth because couldn't, I couldn't open it enough to get a toothbrush in. For two days, the only food Kathy could eat was in squeezable pouches. Then, while watching The 700 Club, Kathy saw Terry Mewson praying. And there's someone else you have a problem with your jaw and the, it's out of alignment, God's healing that. I claimed it immediately and then I put my hand on my jaw and I opened my jaw and I was like, wow. And I kept opening it a little bit, little, little by little, further and further. It's like, oh my goodness, this is me, this is me. You know, God's healing me. And it was really, it was a wonderful feeling. Kathy's jaw was healed. The next day, and to this day, I've never had any more pain with it. I don't have the headaches anymore, and I can open my mouth as wide as I need to. Now I'll eat anything and not even think twice about it. Today, Kathy's so grateful to be able to eat whatever she wants and enjoy life to the fullest, free of migraines. Don't be afraid to ask God for healing. Don't think that you have to deserve it first, because God loves us all where we're at in spite of our shortcomings. And he wants us to be healthy and he wants us to be whole. And first and foremost, he wants us to be happy. I love that. Don't be afraid to ask God for healing. He is the God who, he loves to heal us. He wants to heal you. And you don't have to feel like you deserve it, just like she was saying. In fact, Psalm 103 says, he forgives all of our sins and heals all of our diseases. Well, here is a praise report. Lola from Las Vegas had been dealing with pain in her back and stomach for four months. The doctor diagnosed her with seven kidney stones and a rapidly growing renal cyst. She was home in severe pain, waiting for the doctor to determine the best course of treatment. She was watching the 700 Club and saw the testimony of a lady who had the same issue she was having and God healed her. Lola called the CBN Prayer Center and prayed with a partner for healing. Immediately, she felt better, and after a few hours, all her pain was gone. Lola returned to the doctor a few days later, and he was amazed. All the kidney stones and the cyst were gone. Praise the Lord. Well, I'm gonna pray for you right now. Um, I feel right now that there's someone You've just, you've had an abortion and you are grieving. You are in severe grief and sorrow. And God is saying to you right now, he loves you. He knows what you're going through and you are forgiven and you are going to now help other women who've been through this. I also believe right now that uh, God is healing all kinds of cancers. Uh, if you've got cancer in your body, just start praising God and receive that healing. You know, God is a God who heals. There's absolutely nothing too hard for him. So, and then another thing I want to pray for, and you, you probably want to join me as well, is the folks in Texas. Can we just pray for them right now? Father, we lift up our brothers and sisters and all the folks suffering so much down in the Houston area, Lord, from these floods. And God, we just ask, Lord, that you would comfort them, those who have lost loved ones, that you, those who have lost their homes and all their possessions, that they're in shelters and they don't know how long they're gonna be there. Father, I pray right now in Jesus' name, we agree, Lord, that you are gonna provide for them and you're gonna give them joy in the midst of this storm. God, we know you can do it, you're faithful. But well, we leave you today with this Power Minute from Luke. For with God, nothing will be impossible. Tomorrow, meet Hercules' leading lady and the real-life wife of Kevin Sorbo. Actress and model Sam Sorbo will join us on tomorrow's 700 Club. We'll see you tomorrow. Bye-bye.